Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast that you're listening to right now, thank you so much, called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It is a daily podcast, 365 days a year, and each day we talk to an author about all of the things related to their career, their book, their life, and more in 30 minutes or less, because who has time? I am now an author myself, although I wasn't when I started this podcast, and you can get my new memoir, Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature, wherever books are sold starting July 1st, and my children's book, Princess Charming. You can learn more about me at zibbyowens.com, but really, you're here to learn more about the authors, and that is what we're going to do. Also, be sure to check out all the other podcasts in the Zcast Podcast Network. You can learn more at zcastnetwork.com. Dot com and definitely check out those shows as well. Julie Clark is the author of The Lies I Tell, a novel. She is also the best-selling author of The Last Flight. The Lies I Tell was named a most anticipated thriller by BuzzFeed, Goodreads, Motherly, Pop Sugar, and more, and was selected as a library reads and indie next pick. Her debut, The Ones We Choose, was published in 2018 and has been optioned for television by Lionsgate. She lives in Los Angeles with her two sons and a golden doodle with poor impulse control. Welcome, Julie. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss your latest novel, The Lies I Tell. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here and to talk to you again. Yes. Welcome back. Things have changed a lot since the last time we spoke. Oh my gosh. It's been like a lifetime. And yet not that much. <laughs> I know. And yet not that much. Very true. This novel scared me to death because, you know, your con artist with the conscience here has made me realize that I have like basically made myself this victim by sharing so much, so openly, so many details on social media. So now I'm like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. Whoops. Okay. So tell, tell listeners a little bit about what The Lies I Tell is about. So The Lies I Tell is the story of a woman named Meg Williams, and she's a con artist who travels the country under assumed names, creating elaborate backstories to sort of back up the lies that she's telling. She has very specific targets, though. She's not, she's pretty picky about who she cons, and she plays the long game. Like, she's not, she's not a quick in and out. She's very much, she invests the time. She invests in the backstory. She makes sure all of the little details of sort of what she's trying to become match so that when she finally makes contact with her target, everything is in place to sort of make sense. And so she's been doing this for like 10 years and perfecting her craft because she has one big con that she's sort of waiting to pull. And it's on the man who she believed destroyed her childhood, destroyed her life and kind of set her on this path that she didn't really want to be on. And so she returns to Los Angeles to pull off this final con and take back sort of what was stolen from her. But what she doesn't know is that Kat Roberts, an investigative reporter whose life and career were derailed by Meg 10 years ago, unbeknownst to Meg, she was sort of collateral damage in something that Meg did. She's been waiting. She, she's been looking for her and she's been waiting and Meg returns and Kat's plan is to infiltrate Meg's life and to be someone that she is not as a way to sort of expose Meg and kind of take back what was stolen from her. So it's sort of a cat and mouse story where you're not really sure who's the cat and who's the mouse, but it was a lot, it was a lot of fun to write. I bet. <laughs> well, you, you show us a, almost a dry run with how Meg pursues her old teacher, right? And she's very cunning in that, sadly, her mother has passed away at a young age, and she is really homeless. She's living in her car and doing her laundry at the Y, and dates are how she eats. She mm-hmm. Right? She's like, she figures yeah. out how to play the system so that she has enough food to get her through the, the week. Yeah. I mean, that was sort of how she fell into grifting. She didn't, you know, I mean, I, you know, 
I mean, maybe real con artists who I believe could be sociopathic grow up and are like, I'm just going to steal from people. But, you know, Meg was not one of those people. This was not what she wanted to grow up to become. And she sort of fell into grifting by necessity, you know, like you said, you know, as a way to get a hot meal or a safe place to sleep at night. And then she realizes she's actually quite good at it. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, and targeting someone who harmed someone that she cared about feels right to her. You know, she has a way of sort of rationalizing the choices that she's making. And so for her, she sort of feels like, you know, play stupid games, win stupid prizes, my friend. And I'm here to award you your prize. So very true. I was particularly interested in her con of the teacher and how you can basically um, get someone to fall in love with you if you play these apps correctly. I don't know if this is advice I am giving or... I don't know. I'm not on them. Yeah, I'm not on them. But I do think that... I do think that, you know, with that first con, you know, she doesn't set out to con him. She sets out to get a safe place for her to live. And then the more she learns about who he is and kind of what he did and kind of what he still does, she shifts her thinking about him and decides that, you know, she's going to be the one to sort of make him well, I guess hold him accountable in a way. And so, you know, her, her only goal was to get as much out of him as she could and then, and then move. And she does. And I think that that's one of the things that was really fun to write with Meg was that she, she never steals from people. She doesn't take any, everything she is, she has at the end of a con has been willingly given to her. And Mm -hmm. I did a lot of research into con artists and that's one of the things that people say over and over again is that if a con artist is really, really good, their victims want to participate in whatever it is that they're doing. They just don't realize that they're participating in a crime, you know? And so I wanted to make sure that Meg was, you know, justified in taking what she wanted to take. And I also wanted to make sure that, you know, there couldn't, that that legal ramifications would be hard to follow, meaning, you know, she's what, what they like to call, you know, quote unquote, hard to prosecute Mm -hmm. because a lot of her victims aren't going to want to come forward. And even if they did, you know, when the police say like, well, how did, how did she end up with this $50,000? Well, I gave it to her. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. You know, sorry. That's (laughs) called a mistake, not a crime. Yeah. (laughs) How yeah. do you, how do you think on the other side of things we can make sure not to fall victim to some of these cons? I mean, it, you know, it feels like there are landmines everywhere. I feel like every email I get, I'm like, is this spam? Can I click on this? I now I'm like forwarding even the most mundane emails back to people being like, hi, is this really your birthday party invitation? And they're like, yes, it is. <laughs> I'm like, well, I just didn't want to click and get trapped. Yeah. You know? So, you know, I think there's a lot of awareness now around cyber type stuff, right? Especially if you've known anyone who has been a victim, which I have. But in terms of these more elaborate things, how do you, how can you, when someone is so good at, and this is what they do and they're a real forte in life, like, how do you avoid being just a pawn in their process when, especially when they seem to know all about you, which many of these people do? Yeah, I think, you know, those quizzes on Facebook where, you know, name six cities you've lived in and, you know, what hospital were you born in? And like that, those kinds of things are, are you know, maybe skip those because they're just ripe with information that people can use. And, I, you know, you may think that your friends list is locked down, but you know, I got a friend request the other day from somebody who had like 32 mutual acquaintances from people that I went to college with. And I was like, I don't recognize that name, but it, I'm 52, right? Like college was 30 years ago. I don't, I don't remember a lot of things. And so I texted a couple of my friends that, who were on that person's list and said, like, do you know, do you know this person? Like, and, and all of them without exception were like, never heard of them. And I'm like, well, you're friends with them, you know? And so it's really easy to slip onto somebody's list when there are mutual friends and, you know, you just have to be careful about what you put on social media and what, you know, what are the things that you want to reveal about yourself? And, 
it's a, it's a balance, you know, as an author who, and as you know, you're an author, you're, you're a public figure, like your brand is out there. You have to do these things. Like you have to make yourself available to your readers and your, your clients or whoever it is that you're, that your social media is supposed to reach. But at the same time, you have to hold things back because you can't give them full access to everything because you never know what little detail in a photograph or a video they might pick up on. And then from there, you know, move on. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like my bias is to believe most people are good people and yep. yeah, me too. that is not necessarily the truth. So uh, I don't know. I think that it is. I mean, I think that, I think that 90 5% of people out there are going to do the right thing and are going to be a good person. You know, maybe not when nobody's watching, but we're talking about like, you know, you find a hundred dollars on the ground and you look around and like, okay, you know, but I think that, I think that for the most part, most people want to do the right thing. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. I do. I do. Okay. All right. Then I'll keep my yeah. rosy sunglasses on or whatever. Yeah. A little bit longer. A little bit longer. Well, Julie, tell me about writing this book. I know you said it was fun to write, but like, where did this whole idea even stem from? Like, tell me about the two characters and how you learn more and any research and just give me the backstory. So I was, let's see, I'm trying to think where I was with The Last Flight. I think I had, I think the book had been put into production and I was needing to get started on my next project. And I was sort of writing something else at the time. And I had maybe, maybe a solid half written, you know, of, of this next book that this idea that I had, and we sent it to, we sent it to my editor and she was like, "Mm, doesn't really feel like a thriller. And I was like, oh, (laughs) okay. And I had had this idea. I was, I remember sitting at my son's piano lessons and they were an hour long and I would have to sit in the lobby of his apartment building and just, I don't know, listen to podcasts or, you know, do, and, and I was listening to a podcast about a con artist who in Australia, and it's a, it's a podcast called who the hell is Hamish. And it's about this guy who gets women to fall in love with him. And, you know, then has this like, can't lose investment opportunity. And, steals money from them. And he's done it multiple times and traveled all over Australia and, you know, fallen in love with women and taken their money. And I just remember thinking like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a single woman. I'm a single mom. I'm not out in the dating world, but if I were, I would be super suspicious of any guy that comes in and says like, I've got this opportunity for you. Right. But I'm a generally suspicious person. I'm like you. I'm forwarding all the all the emails and saying, you know, is this you? Did you do that? Never click on any links. I don't, you know, even the phone calls, I feel like the spam calls mm-hmm. that I would answer yeah. that. Yeah. But so I remember thinking like, hmm, you know, he's pretty good at this and I can understand why she might fall in love with him. He's handsome. He's charming. She's lonely, you know. Mm-mm-mm. But then I started wondering, I think a woman could be better at this. Mm-hmm. Like, I just think a woman could be a better con artist because people are more inclined to believe us. You know, number one, when my kids were little, I used to always tell them, if you're ever lost, go find, go find the mom, go find, you know, the mom with the stroller. That's what you're <laughs> for, right. And barring that, you know, go find the grandma. And so, you know, women are inherently, I think more believable. And secondly, we're often underestimated, especially by powerful men. So that combination I felt like was ripe to explore. And so, you know, the people that made targets, I really wanted them to be powerful men who just thought she was not that, not that bright, you know, Mm -hmm. and underestimated her. And, and I just felt like I would like her to take advantage of that bias that we have in society, that a woman is sort of, eh, you know, at one point she's a life coach, you know, and it's such a blurry occupation that, you know, that could mean anything, you know? And, and I think that, that a man like Philip Montgomery, who's the man that she targets for that would be, would be ripe to underestimate her, you know, a powerful businessman who's going through a very bad divorce and wants to milk his, you know, ex-wife for every single penny. Mm-hmm. So, you know, watch your back, man, because we're smarter than we look. Whoa. 
Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> I feel like we need some music. Like, I know. <laughs> yeah. Another trick that I loved that Meg pulled was changing the website for the listing price make, and right. um, marking up a house and then making everybody believe that, making her clients believe that she actually got the price down when in fact she paid over ask. Like that is also like a genius move. (laughs) Every so often, you know, we have a, well, I don't want to, in case she's listening, I don't want to say anything. Every so often my husband said, there's somebody who, who has been like helping us like get certain things like, you know, and he's always like, she always says, oh, I don't know about that. You know, I'm really going to have to try hard. And then she always gets it. And he's like, maybe she says, maybe she always knows she's going to get it, but she just wants us to believe that it's hard. Yeah. I don't don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that Meg does a lot of that sort of sleight of hand stuff. And I wanted, I didn't want to get too, I mean, she definitely uses social media as a way to sort of figure out how she's going to approach people and and what kind of entry point she wants to have. It's never the target themselves. It's always somebody in the target circle because people are suspicious. People are like, you know, why are you approaching me? Who are you? Where did you come from? But if you're so-and-so's friend, then all of a sudden you've got a reference, right? You've, you've got, you know, but I, I was listening, I'm still listening to a podcast. It's about a con woman, uh, Lizzie Mulder in Orange County, who was a, an accountant for businesses And the way that she tricked them was by making her own like advice indispensable, you Mm -hmm. know, and people started relying on her for to, to, to handle these things. Uh, The problems that would crop up, you know, payroll wasn't working right. And she would come in every month and hand write the checks herself. And all the while, the reason why payroll wasn't working well was because she didn't set it up. And so, you know, it's sort of this, it's, it's a sleight of hand, but it's all man-made. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, when you can create a problem for somebody and then swoop in and solve the problem for them, you've built some trust there. And so Meg does a lot of that. Interesting. Well, were you like at all tempted to try any of this stuff yourself? Oh, oh my God. No, right? I'm no I'm <laughs> person. I, you know, I'm the one that got caught chewing gum in school. The one time I did it, like I'm the, I'm no, mm, no, but it was really fun. I mean, like, that's the fun part about writing fiction is that you get to imagine yourself into these roles that you never, ever would do, you know, on your own. I think my parents were a little concerned when they read the book, they were like, <laughs> you know, or this is how your mind works, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, as an author and, a, and an author of thrillers and suspense, you know, we're always thinking about, you know, ways to sort of bend integrity a little bit, you know, it, you know, I don't know what you think when you're sitting at a red light, but I'm always looking at the person next to me and thinking like, she looks like she's got a body in the trunk, you know, look at her. And I have so, to say, I have never thought that about the person next to me at a red light. <laughs> do you think I'm a little weird? You know, they do. sometimes I well, I do wonder about the people. Like, I'm like, I wonder if, you know, especially when we're in traffic, like, yeah. oh my gosh, what is the most horrible thing that somebody is missing right now? Like, maybe they're missing the flight that would get them to this. And there's, you know, maybe yeah. they're saying goodbye to someone or maybe they, it's their, you know. I, I don't know. I always it's go down like body in the back that's starting to decompose and smell. Yeah, Maybe. no. Yeah, not that. No. <laughs> Next time you will, though. Oh gosh, great! I, I just <laughs> yeah, I need more in the anxiety. You know, revolving revolving door there. Thank Everybody. you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah whatever. <laughs> you know, I I thought you did a really compelling job, or that's not even the right way to say that. I thought it was really compelling the way you described Meg's financial crisis, right? You said at one point, like I'm, she was one UTI away from homelessness or hopelessness or whatever, like a cavity, a blister, like any of these little things would be just the last, like that, that couldn't, she couldn't do, she couldn't like handle even one more little thing. And the way even her colleague at the Y in a way that wasn't condescending or whatever, was able to help out and ask her to house sit, even though there wasn't really much to do. And sort of this kindness of strangers without making her feel bad, because there she still has her sense of pride, even though, yeah. you know, with everything that's going on. Tell me about that. And, you know, obviously you're not in this, I mean, I shouldn't say obviously. Well, you seem to have a nice office, but I mean, <laughs> you got some books. I'm assuming you don't live in your car. How do you get into that 
mindset? Did you interview people? Did you just imagine what it would be like and how to go through the day? So just, just barely getting by. You know, a lot of different places that I sort of mind that, you know, books and podcasts, of course, um, newspaper articles, magazines, things like that. You know, I mean, homelessness in Los Angeles, I live in Los Angeles, is a big problem here. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have a property here, you know, when you come, um, it's 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 a challenge and, and encampments are everywhere. And not all of them, not all of them are, you know, drug addicts or mentally ill. Some of them are people who literally got forced out of their homes and they're living in their cars with their student or their children. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm also a teacher and I've worked in a lot of different, in a lot of different communities. And I've had kids in my class who are living in their car. I've sat across from parents in a conference and, and understood exactly why they're not doing their homework because it gets dark at four o'clock and or four 30 and like they're living in their car. So they can't do their homework, you know? And so I do like draw on that sort of level of desperation of understanding that, you know, one, one bad accident, one small accident, one thing that you or I wouldn't, wouldn't really think of and move on. Oh, I broke that or whatever, you know, could completely derail somebody. Mm -hmm. There was a grade. I don't know if it was, if it's technically middle grade or probably, I guess we could call it middle grade. I'm, I'm very blurry on, on some of the terminology of the younger kids books, but it was called shelter by Christy Matheson. And it's about a family and they were just okay until the dad got into an accident and then was in the hospital and they lost their house and then they were staying in a shelter and she was you know, on a rainy day, sort of everything broke yeah. down, right? Just the yeah. rain was the last straw for the girl yeah. getting to school and all of this. And, you know, I think about that book really because it was from the point of view of the child. Um, and not that that was the only one, but the one I read most recently, I guess, of, of just that sort of minute to minute existence and just how tenuous it all can be and how quickly it can all come crumbling down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's scary. It's really scary. And um, we have a lot of people in our country who are living literally day to day, minute to minute. And, you know, it's uncomfortable sometimes to think about it. It's uncomfortable sometimes to talk about it, but the privilege that a lot of people have to say, oh, let's change the subject. Like that's a huge, huge privilege that a lot of people have. And you can't, you can't, you can't do that. You know, you can't turn the conversation away because it's uncomfortable. Like we have an obligation to do something. Yeah. And how, uh, how do you, aside from writing books like this, which of course increase awareness to the whole issue, like how do you personally try to help? I know you're a teacher and I, obviously that helps more than anything is like changing the lives of students or maybe a better question is how would you advise the rest of us to help someone listening who's feeling moved or whatever? What, what should people do? Um, you know, I would, it starts with voting, to be honest with you. It starts with voting for people who have policies that are compassionate and, you know, that makes sense. Um, And, you know, in Los Angeles, I think the problem really started way back in the 80s when we closed a lot of mental hospitals and, you know, there there was just no place for these people to go and the problem has gotten progressively worse. So I really think that the most important thing and the thing that I tell my students all the time, I mean, they're only in fifth grade, but, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, social justice. We spend a lot of time talking about civics and what it means to be a good citizen. And we talk a lot about what the common good means Mm -hmm. for us, for for other people and and how we have to prioritize that. And, you know, you want to vote for people who are going to put the needs of people over self. Right. And, and I think that we are in a, in a crisis right now, you know, in a lot of ways. And I think that the best thing you can do is to vote or find people to contribute if you have money to pay even if $10 to donate to campaigns to write postcards to make phone calls there's lots and lots of ways to get involved and so i just think you you need to you need to wake up and start and 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 realize that you know everybody has a voice and everybody has power and you know i i work really hard to make sure my students leave my class and they understand that like this is their responsibility too, you know? And that just because they're 11 doesn't mean they can't go home and impact the beliefs of, you know, the parents and the older brothers and sisters who are old enough to vote. 
I also think donating to shelters, local shelters, yeah. it's not, yeah. not just money, but even supplies, like getting yeah. the blankets that they need or finding out what they need in, in your community or communities you care about or, you know, inspiring others to sh- support their local shelters. At least you know you're helping someone. Like voting is a one time. It's every couple years. You know, a lot of people want to feel that they're helping and want to make a difference immediately. So anyway, maybe that's one way. So what is coming next? What, what characters can we expect to see on the scene? Um, I am working on my next book right now. I can't really say a lot about it, but it is it it has to do with a brutal murder in a town in 1975 and sort of the fallout from that, um, what really happened and who's really responsible for it. So, um, that's been a lot of fun. It's, it's very different. It's a little darker than definitely a lot darker than the lies I tell. And so we'll see. Yeah. I'm just, I'm still in early, early days. So, so there's not much I can, I can tell, but you know, I'll be, I'll be out on tour for the lies I tell, thankfully in person in lots of cities. So, you know, check my Instagram for, where I'll be, what days, what times, um, East coast, West coast, middle of the country, the South. So yeah. And and what is your Instagram for people who are going right there right now? It is Julie Clark author. Amazing. Um, do you have any advice for aspiring authors before we go? I would say write every day, you know, something, even if you're just journaling out how hard it is and not actually putting fictional words into a page, I think writing every day is something that, everybody can do. Um, If you're waiting for the right moment to get started or the right idea to come before you sit down to write, you're just, you're always going to be waiting. You know, Um, I, I work full time. I'm a teacher. I write every morning from 3.45 to 6 a.m. about, and I do that Monday through Friday. I do that on vacations. I do that. Um, It's just what I do. And so, you know, I, the, the lies I tell is my third book. And I feel like, you know, you can write an entire book and publish an entire book in two hours a day. You can do that. And I think that, you know, people who think, well, I need to quit my job in order to do this. You don't, you don't need to do that. And in fact, I don't recommend you do that. Having a day job really helps take financial pressure off of whatever's going on for me in publishing. I can just enjoy the things that I get and, you know, kind of oof through the things that I don't. And, but, but my livelihood is not tied to how well my books are doing and it helps with the creativity to not need to rely on that. And so don't, don't quit your day job. If you love it, if you hate it, find something else. But, um, I love, I love what I do. I love teaching kids. I love going to school every day and not thinking about, not thinking about publishing for six hours. And you really don't, you don't have time to not, to, to think about it. And, and it's a nice balance. And so I would recommend, I would recommend carving out two days, sorry, two hours a day to, to just write for yourself, whether it's early morning or late at night or lunchtime, or even on a walk and your voice recording stuff. I talked to Alex Finlay and he, that's what he does. He does a lot of talking into a voice recorder and drafting as he walks, you know? And so I think a lot of people have different ways of, of managing the writing with their everyday life. So Teachers don't have time to. <laughs> no, we really don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think an interesting experiment, if I'm ever like in a creative writing class or I don't know, something, I think we should get like, or maybe you could do it with your students, but to get a whole classroom of people and say, and like show them the picture of the car next to you and just have them all make up stories. I'm I interested. Do that. How yeah. many? I, I do. I, do. You do do that? Oh, okay. Well, there you go. That's why you're a great teacher. (laughs) Kids get, they're very creative. They love creative writing. We're doing a fantasy unit right now and you should see they're just so jazzed about it. It's hysterical. Yeah. You know, send any good manuscripts my way. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) That's right. Oh my gosh. All right. Well, I have several several budding authors that are led there. They're very good. Very good. Yeah. I really do think having a teacher who identifies talent and a writer at a very young age makes all the difference. I feel like there's so many authors who have come on and said, well, you know, I've been writing forever because this one teacher said something. So you're that teacher for so many. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, I hope so. I hope so. There's a lot of great stories to tell. And, you know, you don't have to have a fresh idea. You just have to have a fresh take on an old idea, you know? Love it. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, Julie, thanks for coming back on and um, I'll be following along on your tour. <laughs> sounds good. Hopefully I'll see you in New York. Okay. Sounds good. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 